Hi everyone, I'm Anthony Turner, a retired Hampshire inspector, accredited multiple choice question writer and former head of continuation training. Now during my time in this role, I created and facilitated a bespoke study program designed to address a force-wide shortage of officers qualified for promotion to the ranks of sergeant and inspector. Now extending this remit to include officers seeking to become detectives through the National Investigators Examination, by the time I left to return to the front line, this shortfall had been addressed with percentage pass rates in the mid to high 80s. Now the purpose of this presentation therefore is to share this information with you and in so doing offer you an insight into how the system works along with providing access to some of my materials designed to help you achieve success in the exam. Okay, so with all that in mind, let's get started. As you'll be aware, the National Investigators exam adopts a multiple choice question format, the source for which comes entirely from current online or hard copy editions of the Blackstone's Police Investigators Manual. So while there might be a temptation to perhaps buy older sets from a colleague and therefore save a few pennies, personally, I wouldn't, on the basis that the questions are derived exclusively from legislation, case law and keynotes and therefore the importance of being up to date in all such areas is self-evident. For example, in case law, R.V. Ghosh, 1982, once featured heavily when dealing with the issue of dishonesty under the Theft Act 1968. Now that was until Ivy versus Genting Casinos in 2018 and Barton and Booth versus R. 2020, in which the Supreme Court clarified the provisions of law, consent and reasonable steps. However, and for the purposes of the exam, further clarification now states that this test will be considered objectively, good word, in accordance with civil cases set out in Barlow Close International versus Eurotrust International Limited 2006 and Royal Brunei Airlines versus TAN 1995. Consequently, if you're working on the basis of an older copy of the manual, then you may choose the incorrect option when facing a question on this issue. Okay, so in terms of the multiple choice questions themselves, you'll be facing 80 in two hours, which roughly equates to 90 seconds a question. And while this may sound a lot of time, trust me, it isn't, especially if you spent too much time thinking about one question or fretting over another while trying to focus on the next. So if you can learn to deal with this type of head blocker and move quickly on, then please do so or you'll be wasting valuable time. Now each question will be made up of between 55 and 250 words, the purpose being to provide a 50-50 split between reading and deciding on the correct answer. And of those 80 multiple choice questions, 10 which have performed least well in the exam will be removed, thus ensuring candidates are not unfairly penalised. And in turn, the pass mark is set at 55.7%. In other words, you need to get 39 correct answers out of the remaining 70 questions. And further information on these subjects can be found online at the College of Policing website, which I urge you to study carefully to ensure you have a full appreciation and understanding of what is required. OK, now let's take a moment to look at the devil in the detail as to the formatting issues surrounding these questions. Referred to as A-type questions, they consist of a stem, which includes a case study, scenario or vignette, that's a posh word for setting the scene, a lead-in, which specifies the question to which you're asked to provide an answer, and of course four options, of which one is obviously correct, while the other three are what they call plausible distractors. OK, so let's have a look at an example. Here we have the stem. Detective Constable Gotten wishes to carry out non-urgent director surveillance on a commercial car repair garage belonging to Lewis. It is suspected that Lewis is operating a car ringing enterprise at the garage and DC Gotten wishes to obtain intelligence about the operation. So there is your scenario, if you like. And then we have the lead in. So what exactly are they looking for in relation to an answer from you? 
In accordance with Chapter 3 of the Covert Surveillance and Property Interference Revised Code of Practice for 2018, who can authorise this surveillance and for how long? And finally, the um, options that you have available to you. So is it A, an officer of the rank of inspector or above may authorise this surveillance for a period of up to three months? Or is it B, an officer of the rank of inspector or above may authorise this surveillance for a period up to six months? Or is it C, an officer of the rank of superintendent or above may authorise this surveillance for a period of three months? Or D, an officer, again, of the rank of superintendent or above may authorise this surveillance for a period of six months. Now, in this instance, knowing that authorisation for a pre-planned directed surveillance operation rests with a superintendent or above, then immediately this draws your attention to option C or D. And then, of course, if you've done your homework, you'll know that the correct answer is C. And it's that potential conundrum that's the premise for familiarising yourselves with some of those key principles associated with multiple choice question writing and, if necessary, taking advantage of any one or indeed a number of those additional external study aids that are out there in the marketplace. So let's take a look at some of those key principles adopted by multiple choice question writers. After all, if you have a basic understanding of where these questions are coming from, this should help you to maximise your time available for each question. OK, first up then, read the question. Now that sounds obvious, but you may be surprised at how many candidates think they know what the question is about and skip over important information in the STEM and choose a credible yet incorrect option. OK, so here's an example. While on patrol in the high street at 3 a.m., Police constables Gillard and Kimber approach three youths who are in possession of unlit petrol bombs. The youths scatter and throw the bombs away before they are detained and arrested by the officers for the offence of a fray. Now, in accordance with Section 3 of the Public Order Act 1986, a fray, have the officers acted correctly under these circumstances? So what have we got? Is it answer A? Yes, as the conduct of the use would cause a person of reasonable firmness present to fear for his or her personal safety. Or is it B? Yes, as mere possession of the petrol bombs would constitute a threat for the purpose of this offence. Or is it C? No, for this offence to be complete, the conduct of the use must be directed towards property. Or is it D? No. For this offence to be complete, the conduct of the use must be directed towards the person present at the scene. Well, the answer to this question, which you've read carefully, combines the definition of a fray with case law. First up then, the definition. A person is guilty of a fray if he uses or threatens unlawful violence towards another and his conduct is such as would cause a person of reasonable firmness present at the scene to fear for his personal safety. OK, so from case law's perspective, answer A is incorrect on the basis that while R.V. Sanchez 1996 and R.V. Carey 2006 identifies that a person of reasonable firmness does not have to be present at the scene, I versus DPP of 2001 clarifies that in order to prove the offence of a fray, the threat of unlawful violence must be directed towards a person present. So the temptation here is to dive in and say answer A is the correct answer, hence the need to read the question carefully. And answer B is also incorrect, as while possession of the petrol bombs would constitute a threat, the conduct must still be directed towards another. Similarly, answer C is incorrect, as unlawful violence is again restricted by the term towards another and does not include property. And that leaves us with answer D as the correct answer, based on, again, the House of Lords ruling that in order to prove the offence of a fray, the threat of unlawful violence must be directed towards a person present. And that, again, is in relation to I versus DPP 2001. OK, next up, then, we have cover up. And what I mean by that is 
Answering the question in your own mind before looking at the four options will save time when reviewing the answers, but only if you're sure of your facts, for example. Now here, just out of well, sheer devilment, to be perfectly honest, I'm going to go back to the uh, question I uh, identified for you earlier on involving Detective Constable Gotten um, and see whether or not you've remembered the answer. But essentially, the principle is here. If you know what um, directed surveillance is in the in the detail, remember the devil in the detail, then you will be able to dive straight into the correct answer. So just to recap then, Detective Constable Gotten wishes to carry out non-urgent directed surveillance on a commercial car repair garage belonging to Lewis. It is suspected that Lewis is operating a car ringing enterprise at the garage and DC Gotten wishes to obtain intelligence about the operation. So again, in accordance with Chapter 3 of the Covert Surveillance and Property Interference Revised Code of Practice of 2018, who can authorise this surveillance and for how long? So was it A, an officer of the rank of inspector or above, may authorise this surveillance for a period up to three months? Is it B, again an officer of the rank of inspector or above, may authorise this surveillance for a period of six months? Is it C, an officer of the rank of superintendent or above may authorise this surveillance for a period up to three months, or is it D, an officer of the rank of superintendent or above may authorise this surveillance for a period of up to six months? And I very much hope that you're all going to go for answer C. But you see what I mean? Covering up those answers, in other words, don't look at them, get that answer right in your head, you go straight for C and you save an awful lot of time. OK, next up then we've got uh, keywords. Now, recognising keywords in definitions may also help you focus on the correct answer. However, on occasions they can also be confusing. For example, Eels rents a house under a tenancy agreement from his local council. Eels is short of money and decides to sell off several items from the house to help him through a cash crisis. So, which of the following circumstances is correct? when dealing with the offence of theft of land in accordance with section 4, subsection 2 of the Theft Act 1968. Is it A, Eels picks flowers from the front garden to sell at a car boot sale and commits the offence of theft of land? Is it B, Eels severs some topsoil from the garden to sell to his neighbour and may commit the offence of theft of land? Is it C, removes eels, sorry, removes a fireplace to sell at a nearby second hand shop and may commit the offence of theft of land? Or is it D, eels cannot commit the offence of theft of land while under a tenancy agreement? OK, so once you've focused on the tenancy element in the stem of the question, and then the removal of the fireplace and the options, you'll know that when we're talking about theft of land, that C is your correct answer. OK, next up then is to focus our attention on the lead in element of the, of the question. And if we read this first, then we know in some instances what is required from the stem. And then this allows us to, if you like, read the stem from a more informed perspective in readiness for looking at the options. OK, so, for example, the lead in in this question is, is this an offence of blackmail contrary to Section 21 of the Theft Act 1968? So now let's look at the stem and see if we can formulate uh, in our own minds whether or not we are looking at offence of blackmail here or indeed something else. Gilchrist has just started a new job at a bank when she is approached by Baxter, who tells her that he knows she used to be a prostitute and that if she does not have sexual intercourse with his friend, Humphreys, he will inform the bank manager and she will probably be sacked. Gilchrist reluctantly agrees to Baxter's demand and has sexual intercourse with Humphreys. OK, so now we know specifically what the uh, question is asking. In other words, is this an offence of blackmail? We've looked through the stem and we've able to hopefully make a decision as to whether the answer to that is yes or no. So within the options, you have two yeses and two noes. 
Let's have a look at what they are and then see if we can get the correct answer. So is it answer A? Yes, because Baxter makes the unwarranted demand with a view to gain a benefit for another. Is it B? No, because gain for the purposes of this offence extends only to the obtaining of money or other property. Is it C? Yes, because gain for the purpose of this offence relates to anything, including sexual gratification. Or is it D? No, because Baxter did not make the demand with a view to gain for himself. And of course, the answer is B. No, because gain for the purpose of this offence extends only to the obtaining of money or other property. However, be warned, although this is a very useful technique, it's not always the case that this will work, as you'll see from the next example. So here we go then with the lead in. Which of the following statements is correct with regard to Turvey? Well, that's not specific in the same way as the previous question, is it? So what we have to do now is we have to bear that in mind that the following options are going to, one of them is going to be correct, obviously, but that's all linked to the information that you'll find within the stem. So what have we got then? Turvey has just lost his job and is finding money hard to come by. Randall feels sorry for him and gives Turvey a packet of 10 cigarettes that also contains a small amount of cocaine. Turvey knows nothing about the cocaine inside the packet of cigarettes. Several hours later, Turvey is stopped by Police Constable Mayer, who discovers the cocaine inside the cigarette packet. So now you have all of that information. Now you need to determine which of the following statements is correct with regards to Turvey. So is it answer A? As Turvey has physical control of the cigarettes and knows of their presence, he also has possession of the drug. Or is it B? The only requirement for possession is that Turvey had the drug in his physical control. Or is it C? To show that Turvey has possession of the drug, you must show that he actually knew what he possessed was cocaine. Or is it D? Turvey cannot be in possession of the cocaine because he doesn't know of its existence. And the answer is A. As Turvey has both physical control of the cigarettes and knows of their presence, and that's the cigarettes we're talking about here, he also has possession of the drug. Now that doesn't mean that he's necessarily going to get prosecuted because there is the statutory defence of not knowing that you're in possession of the drug, that's fine. But the reality of the situation in terms of what the meaning of possession in this case is exactly that. He has physical control of the cigarettes and knows of their presence. And finally, we have elimination. Now, even though you may not be 100% sure of the answer, eliminating those clearly incorrect options can still achieve a positive result. For example, Constable Jenkins is seeking an inspector's authority in relation to searching a bedsit, which he suspects is occupied by Grant, who is in custody on suspicion of burglary, an indictable offence. Now, in respect of these circumstances, is the inspector able to authorise the search of Grant's bedsit? So is it answer A? Yes, the search may be authorised as it is suspected that Grant occupies or controls the bedsit. Or is it B? Yes, as Grant is in custody on suspicion of having committed an indictable offence, the request may be authorised. Or is it C? No, the search may not be authorised unless it is believed that Grant occupies or controls the bedsit. Or is it D? No. The search may not be authorised unless Grant actually occupies or controls the bedsit. OK, then, knowing the definition of Section 18 of PACE will tell you that mere suspicion on the part of Constable Jenkins as to Grant's occupancy of the bedsit is incorrect, which immediately eliminates answers A and B. OK, so that leaves you with the, uh, the two options of C and D, which are both no options. And in this particular case, the answer is D. And the reason for that is that it is a factual requirement that the premises is or are occupied or controlled. Therefore, an officer's suspicion or belief is insufficient. 
Now, in terms of materials designed to help you achieve success in the exam, there are a host of study aids out there in the marketplace. And before you commit to one, I suggest you take a look at them all to see which suits your individual style of learning. Now, with regards to what I can offer, well, there are four. I've got uh, NIE handbooks. I have a mock exam. I have 400 plus free questions available to you and a free 16 week weighted study program. So let's take a look at those in a bit more detail. So in terms of the NIE handbooks, these are individually priced so you can buy one or two depending on which areas you think you may need to brush up on. Featuring an easily digestible format of flowcharts, case law and questions, they focus on those key areas of learning that regularly appear in the exam while the mock exam offers 80 fully debriefed multiple choice questions, along with a further mini mock of 25 questions, again, all of which are designed to prepare you for success in the exam. And if you'd like to purchase the handbooks or indeed the mock exam, simply log on to amazon.co.uk and search Anthony Turner NIE 2024 and you'll find me there. And additionally, I've also launched a free to access YouTube channel, which provides a series of modules applicable to both the NIE and NPPF Step 2 legal examination for officers seeking promotion. And it's for this reason that only 19 of the 28 models are specific to the NIE. Now, each module offers a series of lead in and two option questions of which there are in excess of 450. The idea being that you can dip into or out of the questions at leisure, whether you're revising at home, walking the dog, or perhaps during that dead time when traveling to and from work. OK, so let's give you an example. Where a person is caught shoplifting and the collective value of the goods stolen is £275, in accordance with Section 22A of the Magistrates Court Act 1980, which of the following statements is correct? Is it A, this figure represents a low value shoplifting and will be tried summarily? Or is it B, this figure is not regarded as a low value shoplifting and may be tried either way? Now, each question will offer you a few seconds of thinking time. So I'll let you do that now. OK, and in this particular case, then the answer is, of course, B. The threshold for a low value shoplifting is 200 pounds and will be heard summarily. But here's the twist. Unless the alleged offender is over 18 years of age and elects Crown Court trial. However, in this instance, the collective value of the goods stolen is 275 pounds and therefore may be tried either way. So what we've done here, and this isn't the case in all of the questions, but, but you will find it from time to time, is the answer will also give you a hint as to what may come up or may have come up um, in the STEM. So, for example, in this case, if the offender is over 18 years of age and it makes it clear in, in the STEM, uh, then you may be looking at uh, a different option. But in this particular case, keep it simple. Uh, the answer is B. OK, then, so all you have to do to access these questions is to go onto YouTube and search at anthonyturner.nppf-nie and you'll find me there. And just to give you some additional guidance, the following slide will sort of run you through that process. OK, so first up then is to put at anthonyturner.nppf-nie into the search bar, then click on my image followed by clicking on videos and as you can see all will be revealed okay so really the only remaining question from my perspective is uh, perhaps to consider a structured revision program now i appreciate that we all learn in different ways and of course one size doesn't necessarily fit all but if you're struggling or indeed looking for some guidance in this regard you may find the following suggested 16-week program useful so with that in mind, it's perhaps worth noting that the Blackstone's Police Investigators workbook covers approximately 84% of the subject areas within the NIE syllabus and therefore provides a useful starting point for creating a structured 16-week programme.
Now, bearing in mind, however, that the multiple choice questions can be derived from anywhere within the Blackstone's Police Investigators Manual, delegates cannot rely simply on the workbook to successfully negotiate the NIE. And therefore, it's important to ensure that this study programme incorporates the manual as part of, in this case, a suggested five stage process. So let's take a look at that. Stage one then begins with the workbook, which offers a catalytic model of learning that provides clearly identified aims and objectives. It utilizes exercises and case studies to explain each area of learning. It cross references sections from the manual for clarification and provides multiple choice questions to test knowledge and understanding. In turn, stage two looks towards the manual itself which explores legislation and, from within the keynotes, case law, from which questions can also be derived. We've then got stage three, which looks at the Blackstone's Q&As. They provide a broad range of A-star multiple choice questions covering each of the four parts contained within the manual. Stage four then goes on to provide additional learning through the provision of the 400 plus YouTube questions, which focus attention on those head scratching moments when two rather than four similar options present themselves as credible answers. And then finally, stage five, you have additional questions or material which are provided by whichever external study aids you may choose to um, uh, refer to for your own individual learning needs. And to add an additional string to your bow, while the following slides offer a suggested week by week list of subject areas you may choose to study, those areas are also graded in accordance with the number of multiple choice questions which have appeared in recent exams. So for a red, you've got a minimum of three, amber, minimum of two, uh, up to one for green, and blue is basically where we've got some new subject areas that have come into the syllabus and there we have four, we only have one in relation to the last two exams. Week one then begins with uh, mens rea, state of mind, and actus reus, criminal conduct, and entry, search and seizure, both of which are um, colour coded in red, and both areas of which you can, if you want to, look to use the five stage programme, uh, beginning with uh, the uh, the workbook, as previously mentioned, and then working your way through to the end of stage five with any other external study aids you might need to refer to or might wish to refer to. So that's week one. Week two, we're looking at uh, the codes of practice, C's D, E and E. Again, that's a red marker for you. Week three, special warnings and RIPA, Regulation of Investigatory Powers Act, uh, both AMBER. And week four, homicide, which is a green, and misuse of drugs, which is an amber. And week five, we've got firearms and gun crime, that's a green, and racially and religiously aggravated offences, that's a red. Week six, non-fatal offences against the person, amber, um, and offences involving the deprivation of liberty, that's a green. Week seven, hatred and harassment, that's a red, and child protection, green. And week eight, theft, which is an amber, and then robbery and blackmail, which are a red. OK, moving on then to week nine, we've got burglary and aggravated burglary, a red, and handling stolen goods, a red. Week 10, we're looking at fraud, again a red, and criminal damage, a green. Week 11, sexual offences, a red. And week 12, child sex offences, a red again, preparatory offences, that's preparatory sex offences, that's an amber, and sexual offences against people with a mental disorder, and that's a green. Okay, so now moving on to weeks 13 to 16, these are subject areas not covered within the workbook, so we are looking exclusively now at the manual itself. So, week 13 then. Uh, release of persons arrested, that's a red. Institute criminal proceedings, that's a blue. Court procedure and witnesses, that's a blue. Week 14, public order, that's a blue. Protecting citizens in the community, that's a blue again. And terrorism and cybercrime, that's a green. Week 15, we've got domestic abuse, that's a blue. Standards of driving, that's a blue. And then finally, week 16, diversity, equality and inclusion, and again, that is a blue. 
Okay, well, that's just about it. I hope you found uh, the presentation useful. And if you have any questions, then by all means, get in touch to, with me, I should say, by email at uh, tonyt2501 at gmail.com. And if I can answer your questions, then I will. In the meantime, good luck with your studies and good luck in the exam.